Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. I'm at the Rubin Museum of Art, where their latest exhibit features photojournalist and activist Shahidul Alam. His photos captures the struggles of daily life and the fight for social justice in his native Bangladesh and South Asia. Truth to Power is his first retrospective in the U.S. The exhibit includes more than 40 of Alam's most iconic images. Museum goers may recognize some. His photographs have been published in almost every major media outlet. Along with the photos, there's also a 3D model of the prison where he spent 107 days. In 2018, he was arrested and detained for giving an interview criticizing the Bangladeshi government. Later that year, Time magazine named him one of their People of the Year. Now here's a look at what's ahead on our show. Community Resist, Minnie Rowe reports on gentrification in Asian American neighborhoods. Endangered Language, Raina Ramirez shares how Asians are preserving their own languages. Dancing Queens, Kyung Yoon discovers why these dancers get better with age. And I meet up with America's hottest playwright who's rocking New York. This and more on Asian American Life. In 2019, she was the second most produced playwright in the country, and you probably have never heard of her. But remember this name, Lauren Yee. Her critically acclaimed Cambodian rock band has found a place right here in New York. Cambodian rock band is almost impossible to describe because it is so many things. It is a family story, it is a history play, it is a rock concert. It is incredibly morally complex for our characters. And, and it's just about survival and joy. Award-winning playwright Lauren Yee, born in San Francisco and now living in New York, is setting up residency at the Signature Theater and she's starting with Cambodian rock band. I'm here to bring you back. The play centers around a father and daughter wrestling with what happened in Cambodia during the brutal reign of the Khmer Rouge. Jo Nyo is the son of Cambodian refugees in real life, and he plays the father. We met up with the newest cast members, veteran actors Francis Ju and Courtney Reed. Reed, best known for her role as Jasmine in Aladdin, plays the daughter Neri, and in flashbacks, the lead singer of a rock band. For Reed, whose mom is Vietnamese and whose father helped Cambodian refugees resettle, this was a history lesson she's grateful to share. Um, when you go to the theater, what you really want to see, and you really want to leave feeling like, wow, this story, I've learned something, this story needs to be told, um, it's something I've never seen before. Ju, last seen in David Henry Wong's Soft Power, plays a character based on a real life person. That story of this father and daughter is framed by a real life person named Doik, who I play in the, in the show, who was a mass murdering war criminal who ran a prison called S21, where students, intellectuals, artists, other uh, Khmer Rouge leaders who were prosecuted and tortured and then executed. The real life Doik was sentenced to life in prison in 2012 for war crimes. I think that Lauren has taken a very specific human atrocity that happened in Cambodia. And part of what she's saying is that this is something that happens all the time. It's continuing to happen. It's happening now. Yi tackles the serious topic of genocide by looking back at Cambodia's history with rock and roll. It was actually the music. I was at a music festival in San Diego that one of my friends dragged me to because she wanted to see her favorite band. And this band was called Dengue Fever. For anyone who doesn't know, they are an LA band who plays a mix of Cambodian oldies from the 60s and 70s and their own original work. I heard it and I immediately was like, I must know more about this band. 
And that led me down the rabbit hole of discovering their inspiration and also what happened to those Cambodian music artists. Two brothers, Ethan and Zach Holtzman, formed the band in 2002 after one brother traveled to Cambodia and heard the psychedelic sounds of the lost covers of 60s and 70s Khmer rock. It was a music genre that just about disappeared when the Khmer Rouge took over Cambodia in 1975 after the U.S. left Vietnam. What a lot of people don't realize is that Cambodia suffered more than any other country as a result of America's war with Vietnam. The brutal regime, led by Pol Pot, killed close to two million people, a quarter of the population during their reign of terror. And the first people to suffer were intellects and artists. Parce que les artistes sont influents. Les artistes sont proches du peuple. So much of that music was burned. Just kind of the first thing that they did when they took over the capital was seize the radio station because they knew the power of music, of culture, of intellectual thought. Popular Cambodian singers like Ross Sare Sotia, <laughs> Sin Sisumat, <laughs> and Pan Ron disappeared and believed killed by the Khmer Rouge, their music almost wiped out. You know, that it's like, as if you took like a bunch, a big chunk of the Motown catalog and just completely erased it. Um, so some of that music you can't get back. Yee's play pays homage to that classic music. The play features both songs from Dengue Fever and Cambodian rock songs from the 60s and 70s. For Yi and the actors, this is also a chance to tell stories from an Asian American lens. What's really exciting about Cambodian rock band is that people like us are getting to tell that story. Yeah. You know, you, you, you might hear this kind of story in other contexts, and usually it's a context where your hero is a white person. And here, the heroes are a Cambodian father and daughter. One thing that's been really great with this show is that we've been able to create a space for Asian American artists and creatives and professionals to come together and experience what theater is like in a room of people who might share some common experiences. The Signature hosted an Asian American night for the first preview and it sold out in four hours. People are hungry for that type of experience, not to say it's the only way that one should watch theater, but I think it is something new and exciting and resonates somewhere in people to try to see what it's like to kind of bring a community together and enjoy this type of story together. Theater goers will have an opportunity to see more. Yi has two more plays coming to the signature. I'm Ernabel DeMillo for Asian American Life. The South Korean film Parasite broke records at the 92nd Parasite. annual Academy Awards by taking home six Oscars, including Best Picture and Best Director for Bong Joon-ho. This is the first time that the Best Picture Award was won by a movie with an all-Asian cast. Parasite is also the first non-English film to win the award. I'm Minnie Rowe. New York City is known for its distinctive skyline and equally sky-high rent. Living in the shadow of all of this luxury are the people who keep the city going. Many are low-income immigrants who live in ethnically diverse neighborhoods. Now, they are also living in fear that urban development will push them out of their homes. It's a situation that many Asian Americans are facing, but thanks to a community-based legal services group, some of those tenants are now holding their ground and fighting back. When Yoon Jae Im moved to New York in 1994, he did everything he could to make it in the big city. But now, in 2003, I've been doing a lot of news in Korea. 
In 2008, he moved into this two-bedroom apartment in Flushing, Queens, and has lived here ever since. 편한 집은 아닙니다. 시설 문제도 굉장히 많이 노후가 됐고, 뭐 화장실, 바닥, 창문, 라지에타, 뭐 난방 관계도 컴플레인을 계속 하면은 금방 조치도 안 해주고. But still, it's home. And because it was close to the subways, Korean markets, and restaurants, Im says he had planned to live there as long as possible. Plus, his partner was wheelchair-bound after suffering a series of strokes. Finding another apartment at his current rate would be a hardship. But his landlord had other plans. 12월 초에 어, 나하고 해가지고서는 저 렌트비 안 받는다고 그냥 나가라고. Around that same time, Im says a, quote, big scary man came by with a written notice that he had 90 days to vacate the premises. Mr. Im has never missed a single rent payment in all the years that he's been living there. Uh, there is no reason why the landlord should not be renewing his lease. Lena Lee is an attorney who is representing him in his case against his landlord. She is also the executive director of Community Resist, a nonprofit organization offering legal services to people like him, helping them fight back their landlords and developers who are trying to force them out of their home. They're not aware of these rights. Uh, they. They think that if they just bear with these conditions and live quietly, that the landlord would have no reason to evict them. We want to help clients like Mr. M who would rather just move out than fight for their rights. Indeed, M was in the process of moving out when he met with Community Resist. He says he felt disgraced and embarrassed that this was happening to him. <laughs> Gentrification is nothing new in New York City. Community Resist have been working for several years in Brooklyn, helping predominantly Hispanic and African-American tenants fight back displacement due to development. Their model is to get ahead of the eviction process, organize tenants' associations, and bring legal action against landlords and developers. But when calls for help started flooding in from Asian Americans in Queens, many of whom did not speak English and had no access to culturally competent legal services, Lee says she knew that, like Brooklyn, it was only a matter of time before rents skyrocketed and the face of the neighborhood changed beyond recognition. Landlords and developers come in and they want to make space for new people who can afford a much, much higher rent. So what they're doing is they're using harassment as a tactic and they're targeting communities that cannot fight back. Lee says it can take as little as six months to a year before an entire building turns over to higher paying tenants. Plus, development is on the rise in Queens, due in part to projects like the Flushing Waterfront, which will turn a 29-acre property into a mixed-use complex of residences and businesses. All of this is unfolding as New York state lawmakers pass one of the strongest tenant protection laws in the state's history. But Lee says strong laws have no teeth if no one is enforcing them. There are a lot of new laws that came into place, especially in New York City, that was meant to protect tenants, especially the tenants who have been living for here for a very long time. But the rate of actually enforcing these laws is very, very slow. Housing court, it is an actual despair because it is so difficult to fight against a system that has always been biased and for the landlords. We have a lot better laws on paper than we have laws in practice because our enforcement agency is so chronically underfunded. Samuel Stein is a PhD candidate at City University of New York and author of Capital City, Gentrification and the Real Estate State. In his book, he explains that real estate is a $217 trillion industry and that developers are incented to build high-end real estate, which usually is not aligned with what the neighborhood needs landlords and developers will continue to do what they're doing uh, to maximize their profits. We need legislative changes to uh, 
protect more tenants, to incentivize the construction of uh, the kind of housing that people like um, Flushing residents really need rather than what speculators and investors are interested in putting money in. So let's talk about this plan. Even city officials acknowledge that there is a severe shortage of affordable years. housing. There are twice as many low-income households as there are homes for them to live in. Over the past 20 years, rent in New York City has increased almost 40 percent, while wages have stagnated at less than 15 percent after adjusting for inflation. We've done this in this city before. Uh, we have had uh, large-scale construction of affordable housing, but I think we've lost the edge in part because real estate has grown so powerful. In the meantime, both Stein and Lee urge tenants to take a stand and fight for their homes, if not for themselves, then for the others who, down the road, will find themselves in the same predicament. So if anyone else is hearing this who has received a similar notice from your landlord, know that you don't have to just move out uh, and that, in fact, if you stay put, you're doing a great service to the city as a whole by keeping our affordable housing stock affordable. This is a problem with a lot of the tenants that we, we go out and speak to, is that they think that they're going up against a Goliath, when really they have all of the strength. It's the source of power really comes from the individual tenants who are able to come together. And if it's not for them, those laws would be meaningless. Thanks to him speaking out, there is now a tenants association in his building. And together with Community Resist, it plans to bring a group action lawsuit against the landlord. Community Resist stresses that this is a far cry from white flight, a phenomenon in the 50s and 60s when white populations migrated from these very areas as it became more racially and ethnocentrically diverse. The difference is the people then left on their own accord, whereas the people now are being forced out against their will. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. We all know New York City is a melting pot, but it's also become a museum for the world's most endangered languages. In the highlands of Tajikistan, folk songs in the language called Wahi may soon fade away. Only 40,000 people speak this language in the Pamiri region that spans the highlands of China, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. These dwindling numbers put Wahi and other Pamiri languages on the endangered language list. By the end of the century, we'll lose somewhere between half to 90% of the world's languages. Linguist Daniel Kaufman is a professor at CUNY. He's also the founder of ELA, the Endangered Language Alliance. The organization is working to preserve the world's disappearing languages in New York City. Here are the numbers. There are 7,000 languages in the world, and linguists say 3,000 languages will be wiped out in the next century. One language dies every 14 days. Like artifacts in a museum, folk songs in Waukee like this are being cataloged in New York by ELA and then shared online. We have social media, you know, in not only native speakers, but, you know, uh, other like people around the world can hear how it sounds and how it looks like. And through our videos, we also show the culture, not only just the, uh, the language, how beautiful it is. Husnia Hujamyorova is a linguist with the Endangered Language Alliance, an immigrant from Tajikistan, She's working to preserve Wahi and its family of languages. When you lose a language, I think you lose your culture. You lose your identity. For Husnia, it's personal. Wahi is her mother tongue. What makes a language endangered is um, when it's not documented, when it's not written, when there is no alphabet. Like many dying languages, Wahi is unwritten, passed down by oral tradition. So ELA created an alphabet system for it. And this is uh, the sample of, of the Wahi language. Drawing from her background in early childhood development, Husnia is writing a children's book in Wahi based on a Pamiri folktale. 
Husnia says Pamiri languages are surviving in pockets of New York City. There are more than 650 languages spoken in New York. ELA published this map, breaking down which languages are spoken by neighborhood. We work primarily with immigrant uh, communities here who speak endangered languages. There's many, many communities now, especially over the last 20, 30 years, who have come to New York uh, and have brought their own language that is being lost back home. ELA is not alone preserving languages. I just wanted to say thank you for coming to the Khoisanese language class. Kim Moy, who grew up in New York City's Chinatown, is working to preserve the languages she grew up hearing. Uh, Khoisan Cantonese people were one of the uh, first wave of Chinese immigrants to come to America. They came during the Gold Rush and helped build the United States Transcontinental Railroad. Languages like Toisan and Wahi are being lost to the lingua franca or common language of their countries. Back in the Pamiri region in Brooklyn, I met up with Husnia at the restaurant Caravan, the only place in New York that serves shuk choy, sort of a savory chai latte with walnuts and butter. This is where traditions beyond words bring her comfort. So good. <laughs> this, this is home for you. This is home for me. This is what I love about New York. The New York City language map is available on elalliance.org. For Asian American Life, I'm Rainer Ramirez. I'm Kyung Yoon at the Korean Community Services Senior Center in Flushing, Queens, home to the Dancing Queens, who are proving that the joy of movement is ageless. Kyung-ok Lee recently turned 80 years old, but that hasn't stopped her from coming out to practice every Thursday and Friday afternoon with the senior dance team of the Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York. She says it's her secret to staying healthy and young. <laughs> Healing, body healing. The dancers range in age from mid-60s to mid-80s. Most are grandmothers. All of them are immigrants from Korea, and some of them struggle with less than perfect health. 84-year-old Susan Lee has diabetes and a heart condition. Plus, she needed knee replacement surgery. But you'd never know it watching her on the dance floor. The dance team is one of many programs for senior citizens offered by the Korean Community Services. Linda Lee is the president and CEO of the 47-year-old social service organization that provides critical programs and, more importantly, a sense of belonging for older Korean immigrants. There's art classes, calligraphy classes, painting. There's, I think, two choir classes that we have, and as well as ESL here at the Senior Center. And it's really so that they feel independent, that they feel um, like they can thrive uh, socially as well. And the dance class in particular, I personally find that this is so important for the seniors because it helps them feel joy. It makes them feel like they have a purpose um, and they're usually invited to a lot of these community events to perform. <laughs> The thing I love about the dance team is that it really um, breaks down this stigma that if you're of a certain age, you cannot do certain activities or you can't look a certain way or do things that are typically seen as, I guess, more hip or fun. It's great to have seen the seniors really grow and thrive through this dance class and to be able to actually have this boost 
you know, their morale, you know, make them feel. I think one of the biggest issues that we find with the senior population and the older adult population is depression and isolation. And so the importance of this senior center in general is to provide a place for them to come, have friends, share a meal together, participate in these activities and classes so that they're not at home. It just you know, sitting at home alone. Some of these women have been dancing with this group for more than 10 years, and it seems clear that none of them are planning to slow down anytime soon. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. Asian American Life is proud to celebrate March Women's History Month. Our team of correspondents and producers continue to pave the way for Asian American women in broadcast journalism. That's our show for now. Be sure to check out Shahidu Ulam's Truth to Power exhibit here at the Rubin Museum of Art. For more information, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Asian American Life. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We'll see you next time. <laughs>